Welcome to Vic Glenn Radio's Eat, Drink, and Be Merry show, where we love to talk about food, drink, recipes, and techniques, and where to shop, taste, and play. Let's go. Welcome, everybody. Today, we're excited to have Clay Schwab join us to talk about his biography on a family member. It is called Manny Schwab and the George Dickel Company, and we're going to be talking about some Tennessee whiskey. In fact, Tennessee whiskey that they say dwarfed Jack Daniels. And apparently Manny was quite a powerful man out in the Nashville region. So we're going to dig into this, but I encourage you to go get the book and go to the website, mellowasmoonlight.com. Who doesn't like that? Uh, So welcome. How are you, Clay? Oh, I'm doing fine. You just froze up there for a second. But um, I'm doing fine, doing great. And I really appreciate your being here today. And um, I'm very very proud to be on your broadcast because what you all are doing is pretty incredible. Well, thank you. I think it's pretty incredible what you did. I know digging into family history is no easy task, and yet it's it takes you down a lot of rabbit holes. Do you think that happened to you going into this family family history? Oh, yeah. I mean, I backed into it. I had no idea I was going to write a book. Uh, there were just some uh, three or four different little touchstones that kind of propelled it uh, into, into where, where it had a life all its own. And, um, wow. and along the way, uh, uh, I mean, it was such a learning experience, but it was also a very uh, overwhelming experience. I mean, it, uh, it, you know, I started looking into this probably 10 years ago, but uh, really focused on it for the last four years. But it became a much more of an ordeal to publish something than I thought. Um, yeah. But it's very much worth it. It's been, a, uh, it's been quite, a, quite a journey. Well, it's interesting because when I was starting the book and reading, you know, you've got people involved in it. And it seems like your family got involved, your sons got involved. This is not, you know, a solo task, but you were asking people like, well, why didn't anybody cover Manny Schwab? He did all these things and everybody kept looking to you because no one's told the story yet. And that means you. So you kind of got, you know, pegged as it to do this. Well, because the more I looked into it, um, I mean, I was looking at initially into the George Dickel uh, company, the whiskey at, uh, angle of it, because then it all got started with uh, uh, who the New York Times um, declares as the dean of whiskey writers in America, Chuck Cowdery. He has a website that he's had for uh, like 30 years, but he's been writing about whiskey. And my, my son one day told me uh, um, that he had done one on George Dickel, but really on the fact that distilleries weren't telling the real story of their histories. They were creating these Keebler elf type uh, images of the, of the originators and just make, make believe stories. And uh, uh, Chuck said, uh, surely there must be some swabs out there that would <clears throat> want to correct the, the record here. Cause I mean, Manny wasn't mentioned, but uh, so, I mean, I started off looking at <clears throat> the whiskey angle, but the more I got into it, the more involved I became with who Manny was, because he, um, there was so many things that he had touched on that I had no idea. I didn't even know anything about the man or his father, who was an Alsatian um, immigrant from, um, who came here in 1822. I mean, he was 22, and um, uh, he had no contacts here whatsoever, but started some whiskey, um, ch- imported champagne and brandy stores in four different cities. But uh, what the surprising part to my family was that he was at, uh, um, verged on being an Orthodox Jew, and we had no idea that oh, that wow. was in our past. And um, <clears throat> he uh, created the congregations, the first congregation, Jewish congregations in Youngstown, Ohio, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, Nashville, wow. Tennessee, and Knoxville, Tennessee. And um, so anyway, that there were so many surprises along the way that uh, they were delightful surprises. Well, with this, you know, because this is all Tennessee whiskey history, and then there's bourbon in Kentucky, and do not get the two confused as, as far as I've been taught. <laughs> do not do not step over, right? Um, but one thing I wanted to touch on, um, Manny Schwab, right? And then there's George Dickens. So who... who George Dickens, yeah. Dickel. So I don't... Why did I keep... Because I'm thinking it's a Dickens story, see? No, sure no but, yeah. a Dickel, but... The Dickel Company. So can you give us a, an overview of the two people, like the George Dickel Company, that name, 
but yet Manny Schwab did so much. So tell us about that part. Okay, it, um, I'll try to give you the short version of it. Uh, Abraham Schwab, <clears throat> Manny's dad, as I said, it started these, sto these uh, stores that uh, were, were really introducing fine whiskey and French champagnes to the region because he was, you know, come from Alsace, France. And so he had all these connections. Mm -hmm. And um, so the family, uh, his son-in-law, his son, um, and eventually his uh, brother-in-law, uh, the whole family got involved in this business. And then um, the Civil War happened and um, the family began seriously smuggling through, this, uh, through the Yankee lines of occupied Nashville. And um, to the extent that they were get, <clears throat> earning the equivalent of $50,000 a week, with uh, they had a wow. uh, fleet of uh, cloth bottom wagons that they were uh, going through the, the Yankee lines, going to Louisville, Kentucky, and to Atlanta, and again, earning about $50,000 a week throughout the war per run. And they had like 10 wagons that were doing that. Wow. At the time. So they, and um, uh, to the point that, um, the, the 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 general who was in charge wrote a book, uh, Fitch, it was his name, and uh, said that they, it was impossible to stop uh, the Jewish smugglers that were coming through here. Even uh, uh, General Grant's order number 11 was uh, was that all Jews had to leave Tennessee, Missouri, um, Mississippi, and Kentucky uh, and could only take what possessions they could carry. Um, good, because the smuggling had gotten so bad. Wow. Lincoln found out about it two weeks later and, and was furious and rescinded the, the order. But anyway, so the family accumulated this huge amount of wealth. The, the, uh, the uh, war ended and um, they needed to somehow legally get that money into, into the flow of things. And, and a, a close friend of Abraham's in Nashville was uh, a shoemaker named George Dickel. Okay. And, and so uh, they started this company, um, and uh, I believe it was in addition to being a whiskey company, it was a laundry. <laughs> but yeah, I, I was gonna. <laughs> that's what I was gonna say. This sounds like you know, kind of reminds me of that uh, Netflix series Ozarks, where they had to like launder a lot of money. I, I don't think a lot of people realize what was going on. We we think about um, how NASCAR was started with moonshiners and. Um, with, with, you know, basically, you know, the cars racing and smuggling and, and all of that in North Carolina. But I didn't know that there were wagons, you know, and, and the Jewish folks of uh, that, Tennessee. That, that, was amazing. that was amazing to me. And, and um, I mean, what it must have been like to be 22 years old, Jewish, coming to this country from Alsace, from, uh, from France. I mean, talk about brave and jumping in. There, there's no community. There's no no con Jewish congregations, you know, Manny's dad started the congregations, but um, anyway, it was a very much a family uh, situation to the point where uh, Manny and George Dickel married sisters and they lived together oh. for 30 years uh, in Nashville. Um, and M Mrs. Dickel, Augusta Dickel became a very close with the family, actually lived with them until her death in, uh, in 1919. But, um, Back to the, during the Civil War, when they were starting that company, uh, the George Dickel Company became the largest importer of anything in Nashville. And it became the most valuable, um, and this is coming from uh, records, the most valuable uh, distillery of its type in the country. And, um, and it was a Cascade Whiskey is what they founded. And, um, and that, that's a story within itself. But anyway, that that's that's how that was the beginning of George Dickel Company, and George Dickel again had been he was old thirty years older than Manny, and um, he uh, <clears throat> was a shoemaker and he was injured in a horseback riding accident, and uh, you know pulled out of the company and Manny ended up a hundred percent owner of, of it until we sold the company. My family sold it in nineteen thirty seven after prohibition. Wow, after prohibition, how did they handle prohibition? Oh wow, <laughs> that's well. A come big, on, <laughs> well, I don't. You can't give everything away because people need to get the book, right? But well, how Manny, did they handle that? Well, well, Manny was uh, he was known for as the owner of Tennessee politics for thirty years. His adversaries called him that. He was called a one man Tammany Hall. He was also called the the debaucherer, 
of more young men in Tennessee than any anyone else because of his Cascade whiskey and his, his he owned all these saloons in Nashville. Um, but it was all about, uh, I mean, if you read the obituary of Manny, uh, it was two two columns, front page, in newspapers all over. And um, he, uh, he was a director of four banks, director of three railroads. He was wow. uh, the owner of the electric company, the uh, owner of the first... Um, <clears throat> the first uh, car deal, one of the first car car dealerships in Nashville. Wow! Um, he bought the Centennial Park, which was uh, they had a Centennial uh, Exposition, two hundred and sixty acres on the edge of Nashville, on the largest building in Nashville, a uh, uh, Casternock, a uh, five story whole block, on uh, dozens of downtown uh, businesses, but that had nothing to do with with whiskey. But he, his reputation was was dark when it came to Republicans, because uh, the Republican Party became the anti uh, I mean, the prohibitionist party, and the D Democrats became the uh, prohibitionist party, uh, anti-prohibitionist party, but it was, uh, I mean, that's a story within itself, too. I mean, uh, Manny, in politics, um, was constantly accused of, of bribing um, the governor, senators, mayors, the chief of police, in order to avoid rates of his different establishments that he held, but also to try to stave off the oncoming prohibition. And um, he single-handedly almost um, moved the, the final uh, prohibition in Tennessee by about a decade. He was able to slow it down. That's what wow. they were trying to do throughout his tenure as owner of Tennessee politics. Um, but on the other th other hand, when you read that obituary, you would think he was the high, most highly esteemed person in Nashville. I mean, uh, they said he was the wealthiest citizen in Nashville, one of the three wealth wealthiest in the South. And he, all of this came from the start of smuggling through the Civil War. But he was able to leverage, obviously he was brilliant when it came to marketing. Um, the, he, he took, he more single hand, almost single-handedly uh, placed Tennessee whiskey on the map. Um, mm. Tennessee whiskey was considered inferior to bourbon, just a, the, the rot gut that you would buy if you couldn't afford the Kentucky mm -hmm. bourbon. But he took Cascade whiskey to uh, to uh, DRC advertising company, um, and he and one other company were their first two clients, and they took them both internationally. The other client was Coca-Cola. Um, Whoa. Uh, so Manny was very forward thinking, um, but he saw he knew that prohibition was coming, and that's why he diversified so much. Mm. Well, I think yeah, diversified. So he was really, you know, I was talking to you before we recorded, going, "Well, I know this will be on our way back when history show because of the family history and the history of Nashville's connected." Well, now I'm thinking it's it's definitely on our Eat, Drink, Be Merry show because we cover food and drink. And now I'm going, this has got to go on our business podcast because it is, you know, it's interesting because people like Manny, um, they know to, to build relationships and um, to connect with people to keep your business going. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have those relationships and you have to show up. You can't just be in a relationship and use. You have to, it's a two-way street. And it seems like he understood the value of showing up and being present and then also being aware of what is going on in politics, whether you like it or not, to to deal with it. You can't just put mm -hmm. your head in the sand. So he very, seems like a very thoughtful, um, he's a visionary, pretty much. Very much. I mean, that, I mean, think about back then, I mean, to be director of, uh, three different railroads, including Pullman, um, four banks, but then the electric company, the um, and the uh, automotive industry. I mean, he was you know had his fingers That's amazing. In, in almost everything. Um, and again, no one had ever heard of him, and that was driving me crazy. Um, <laughs> because uh, the more I found out about him, it was like how how in the world is he not part of? I mean, in the Tennessee archives, the state archives, the Library of Congress, in all my research, I couldn't, I mean, I've had hundreds and hundreds of newspaper articles. Um, 
that mentioned Manny, but he never was interviewed. He would not step out of the shadows. And um, and but, but reading all those, that, that's a whole nother story about the, the newspapers in general. I mean, that's where I got most of my information, but that's also where I would diverge from my research because I would start reading a newspaper and I couldn't put it down. The way that people wrote back then was um, so different than the journalism of today. Um, I mean, they actually used shutter adjectives when, when they wrote. Uh, the, the journalists would inject themselves in the stories and they, the, they would bring it to life. And so as I was doing my research, the, um, just the, the era came to life. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, I began bemoaning the fact that, that Hemingway murdered the adjective in 1920s. <laughs> So a, it's the iceberg the, theory, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it, journalism was never the same after that. But um, <laughs> but what finding all this out and knowing that, I mean, when the, the largest federal seizure of any kind was when the the uh, Republicans took uh, as soon as prohibition went into play in Tennessee, they uh, seized Manny's Cascade Distillery, and. Um, mm -hmm. At the time, it was the largest federal seizure of, of any kind whatsoever, and the um, newspaper stated that to 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 emphasize the significance of Cascade to Tennessee, um, from 1905 to 1908, they paid in today's dollars over 30 million dollars in taxes, which was 25 percent of the taxes paid by all distilleries in Middle and West Tennessee combined. That's how wow. it did. In the have you ever heard of Pappy Van Winkle? Yes. Okay, where well, he's, I mean, his whiskey today sells for over $1,000 a bottle. Um, and during, when Tennessee, when Prohibition happened in Tennessee, we had to move the distilling out. And because Kentucky still had legal distilling. And we moved it to Louisville, Kentucky, uh, and to Stiesel Company there. Um, and Pappy Van Winkle was the president of it. And, uh, but my, that two of my uh, great uncles moved with it to manage the distilling of Cascade. And in 1963, Pappy Van Winkle, a very old Pappy Van Winkle said, yes, we, we did have the great Cascade whiskey. Uh, it's like it's not been seen for, since Prohibition. And um, I can attest to that because um, my cousin, George IV, uh, let me have a tasting of 109 year old Cascade whiskey. And um, it was my sister who claims to only drink Miller Lite because everything else makes her misbehave. That's what she says. So um, but we were at George's house, George Swab's house, and we took a little sip of it, and her eyes just lit up. She went, to oh. another sip, and said, I could drink this all day. I mean, there, oh. was, there was no kit of bite. It's mellow as moonlight is what it was. Uh, it's oh. Wow. And, and, it, and it, it the was, and the and the moonlight part is really cool because that's when you know the moonshiners used to do it out by moonshine. So it's kind of cool to kind of have that tag in there of you well, know, where the, the tag, moonlight. Where the tag came from was the distiller Key Davis, who uh, worked for my my great grandfather, um, and his son married my great grandfather's daughter. But um, he was the distiller, and he was a master. He was a craftsman, an artist. Uh, there's been stuff written about him. But he insisted on cooling the whiskey mash <clears throat> at night under the moonlight. And he said that gave it its mellowness. And um, that's where mellow as moonlight came from. Oh, wow. I love that. You see, but those stories are priceless, right? That just, I mean, for advertising, too, you know that that's a good story, right, for PR. That's a good PR story. <laughs> it what, is. What, I, what I've tried to convince the distillery is carrying my book. Uh, they, they've really embraced this whole whole thing. And um, they um, uh, I've, I've been trying to get them to actually use that quote from Pappy. I mean, they should put on a bottle of whiskey. Um, it's Cascade. It's it's like it's not been seen since Prohibition. Pappy Van Winkle. <laughs> 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 They could sell their hundred dollar bottles of whiskey much easier that way, I think. Wow. Wow. Doing this though, I mean, really getting into your family history, and at least you live in the region where your family was. Did you go and do like DNA and do that kind of ancestry.com kind of research as well to to really kind of get some clear, you know, because stories get handed down in our families and then we go, 
well, that's not true later. We find out and then we'll find the real story. We go, well, maybe we wanted to believe the other one. I don't know. <laughs> well, see, there, it was kind of the reverse in my family. Growing up, um, <clears throat> I knew that that we had owned George Dickel Company. And I knew that we owned a lot of buildings downtown Nashville still. And there were some really imposing old squab homes throughout Nashville. But no one ever talked about where the money came from or how... Mm. Uh, or who made the money? Because it certainly wasn't my dad or any of the swabs I knew. <clears throat> none of them worked. Um, <clears throat> they had that much money and oh, wow. and no incentive to go out and work for some reason. But and so I, that's a whole other story. But <clears throat> the Jewish part was never mentioned either. And uh, so all of this was brand new to to me and to my family. But they are they're all very happy now to have this out. You know that this is who we are. And this is how the story because it didn't exist. <clears throat> and um, when I when it finally dawned on me that that Manny just wasn't in the history books, and he <clears throat> was not recorded that the impact that he had for forty years in Nashville, um, I sought out the um, sage of Nashville, uh, Ridley Wills, who wrote a forward for the book. He's mm -hmm. written over 30 books on Nashville. Amazing. And he and I became close friends and had long talks about all this. And um, you know, I asked him, I said, how in the world is this possible that nobody's ever heard of him? I mean, there's a book called <clears throat> by uh, Bill Carey. It's called um, Fortunes, Fiddles, and Fried Chicken. And it's the history of business in Nashville. No mention of Manny. And, um, and I said, how is that wow. possible? And he pointed at me and said, because you have to tell the story. So I went to Mount I Olive. Like that where the, the family plot is when George Dickel was buried right there next to Manny Swab. Oh, wow. And I promised Manny that I would write the book and that made me finish it because it, it became overwhelming at some points. And I said, well, I promised him I got to do it. So, well, I mean, you're reading the newspapers and you get in. I mean, number one, we're don't we kind of miss newspapers like just in general? I, I mean, I, we we used to be a print magazine, you know, and now it's digital, which is, is great in a lot of ways. But I kind of miss the old school turn the page, you know, in my hands, you know, um, what, that, that would happen all the time. I mean, again, there's 225 newspaper citations in the book, but I've read hundreds more articles because I'd be reading about Manny. And there'd be something about a fire next to that. And then next to that, it's something about a horse and buggy wreck and I end up wow. just it was just fascinating to read it wow. well isn't it it's great to um get the history of a, of a place a sense of place and it's it's awesome that those newspapers have been saved you know um but with this with you writing this because it's it is it is a lot of work to not only do the research but then put it into story form that is something palatable for people to read and obviously you've got that that down you've got it you, you know how to write and get us in there um and very honestly very candid um okay. you know it, yeah and and for people to grab hold of it do you think it's like okay you know we need to show as much more history of nashville than you know just country music because you know i think people have like a one tunnel vision of nashville sometimes absolutely in nashville i mean the uh from the 1850s through the gay 90s up to um, Prohibition, it was very much like the Wild West in uh, in Nashville. Um, Nashville, I mean, how many people know that the very first city in all of the Americas to have legalized prostitution was Nashville? I don't think wow. many people know that. But you um, had a legal prostitute in your book. <laughs> <laughs> it was not legal. That was my, my great aunt. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, well, you know, <laughs> just say, yes. but it wasn't legal. It wasn't legal. She was, it was yeah, by it, choice. It wasn't legal for her, but during during the Civil War in Nashville, they experimented with legalized prostitution, and it was an enormous success. Um, the um, the the uh, disease rate of the of the Union soldiers went from seventy percent down to ten. Um, wow! And it, it was a, a very successful experiment, and um, I think that's why Nashville. During the gay 90s, Nashville, and my grandmother explained that to me as well, um, it became not acceptable, but understood prostitution down in, in the uh, 
men's quarter, which was from uh, Church Street to Second Avenue. Um, and there were, it was just peppered with dance halls, sporting houses, um, brothels, really, and um, saloons. Manny only at least four of them, and the most elaborate mm -hmm. dazzling one, the climax. Um, but my grandmother said that all the all the wives knew never walk walk into the men's quarter because you're going to see everybody's husband that you know, and, and they were just hanging out at these places, and there were gambling halls. There were, um, but they were incredibly elaborate architecturally. They're mm -hmm. beautiful. Uh, I mean, the Silver Dollar Saloon is down in the heart of music a row in Nashville right now. That was owned by Manny. And um, that one with architect, I mean, it had thousands of silver dollars embedded in the tables and, uh, wow. and the two round windows that are still there that had a giant silver dollars in them. Um, wow. My sister remembers seeing them, actually, before they tore it all up. The Hard Rock Cafe owns it now. But mm -hmm. um, yes, I mean, to your point, Nashville was, I mean, it was called the the uh, Athens of the South before it was Music City. And that's because mm -hmm. of the Parthenon, because of the Centennial uh, Exposition that they had there, uh, uh, 1790, I mean, 1894, I think it was, a year after it should have been. But um, those pieces, everybody is just focused out so much on the uh, music. There's so much more to the history of Nashville that mm -hmm. predates the music part. Yeah, it's interesting too because when you think about how prohibition came to be, it was you know men were drinking too much, coming home drunk, not being good to their wives, and then it's like okay, now we're gonna you know take the take the bottle away from you, yeah. and you know it's so it's kind of interesting, and then Nashville later goes you know watch this, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're taking it all back and we're raising you some, well, you know made... it just seems like. That's interesting. The prohibition, a very interesting little story was in, the, in, the, in uh, well, what had happened was, was Manny was the, the chief strategist and field general uh, for the wets, wets and dries. That's what they call the anti-prohibitionists okay. and prohibitionists. Um, and Nashville was a political war zone um, from 1890 to 1915, really. And um, it exploded the um, Tennessee politics to the point where the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, each of them split in half, reformed the, the, the wets and the dries, and uh, with Manny charging down, trying to push prohibition off into the future. In 1911, the, state led, the Republican state legislators retreated to Decatur, Alabama, and refused to come back to Tennessee to, keep a, to deny a quorum for a vote of a, a bill that Manny had secured enough votes for to pass that would have pushed prohibition off into the future. I mean, yeah. it was just um, the divisiveness was astounding. I and mean, we think it's divisive now, but I mean, prohibition was the, the divisive you know, topic of the day because of exactly what you would say or what you were saying. Because um, we forget about that part. And um, recently we were with friends and you know, I was like, you know, prohibition, la, la, la. And, and uh, you know, just kind of going off and like, that was a stupid idea, you know. But yeah, then what, what everybody focuses on is what it was like during prohibition. Mm -hmm. with yes. The and all of that leading up to it is fascinating. Mm -hmm. of what what, it, what the, the battles that were going on and uh, and what it did to the, to the country in general, but certainly to Tennessee was, um, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Edward Carmack, Senator, U.S. Senator was shot dead in the men's quarter on 7th Avenue in Union um, by uh, an opponent's son. The, the opponent was there too, who shot, uh, Carmack shot at them first. They were, had been closest of friends who were editors of competing newspapers. And um, he was shot and killed downtown. And that, that was the wow. issue. And um, Manny said that his quote is quoted as saying that. Uh, that Cooper killed um, Carmack and Whiskey with that shot, because that 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 gave enough impetus to the uh, the anti -pro to the prohibitionists to pass the uh, right. Now it's like you can't behave yourselves now, yeah. you know. Yeah, it it is interesting because it is like you know you can't behave yourselves. So we're gonna. It's like you know 
you, it's like we were being treated like children as is human you know human beings back then but at the same time what's interesting when you talk about that decisiveness and what was what's going on now this is really showcasing how history repeats itself yes you know yes that's was the way interesting the, 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 the divide got so big that the um that politics didn't work anymore and um and, we, and we're we're right there again Oh, I was going to say, yeah, it sounds like now, but, you know, well, thank goodness for whiskey, right? Because <laughs> we <laughs> need it at the end of the day, you know, rye whiskey, rye whiskey, but, but I love this, you know, this family history. So for you, you know, obviously you can you go see, you know, uh, the, the resting place of Manny and uh, George Dickel. Um, I won't call him Dickens again. I don't know why I've got Charles Dickens is sitting there going, okay, give me some whiskey, but um did were you do you have any you know are you able to see any of his writing like did he have any you know diaries or journals or business well, notes he, that you can get that 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 feeling he really from? shot away from that the only thing i have found was a letter i mean he had his fingers in everything and the tennessee exposition the tennessee centennial exposition was enormous mckinley president mckinley mm -hmm. launched it got it going and stuff but they had a um huge um, uh, home that they had built um, in Centennial Park, 260-acre Centennial Park, downtown Nashville, on the western edge of downtown Nashville. And uh, Manny wrote a letter to the uh, to the club that was going to run it, saying that he would manage the uh, restaurant there in, in, in the very best, highest quality possible, I mean, white tablecloths and everything else. And he promised not to sell whiskey if they would let him uh, run it. And they did. He got it. He ran it. It was very successful. And then at the end, it's the, the city sued him for making profits off of uh, whiskey and and uh, cigars, even though he didn't sell it there. All those people had come into to the Nashville area, millions of people, to see, you know, see the exposition. And uh, they sued him for making all that money off of it. And uh, his, his point was, well, if it was illegal, then you can't tax it because you can't tax illegal money. And so they they lost. <laughs> he won. Wow, I love this. Well, this is you know this is interesting too because, well, see that that's that he's cool. He's smart. He, he's definitely a smart man, right? But um, when it comes to having all of these businesses, you think about nowadays, right? We have all this digital communications. I know you've been in communications in in your career. Look at how communication has changed. You know, we're talking about the newspapers and using adjectives and, and setting the scene, right? The newspaper, the journalist really set the scene and told the story. And now we've got opinions and arguing and talking heads on TV. And we've got cell phone technology, internet. We've got so much compared to when Manny was alive. How did he manage to do run all these businesses? It seems like he had to have put the right people in the right place and well, trust he them. Did, a lot of it he did with family. Um, okay. I mean, there were seven members of the family in the George Dickel company. And, um, but, but that, that was part of it. But um, I really don't understand how he, how it was possible to accomplish what he found. Um, if you read the book, you just shake your head. It, 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 each chapter, all of a sudden, there's something else that this guy's getting into where he's making tons of money doing it. And he's making contacts with people, the movers and shakers of Nashville. Uh, like I, I, I told you about that book, um, uh, Fortune's Fiddles and, and Fried Chicken. Mm -hmm. I mean, it had all these old millionaires in there, None, obviously nothing about Manny, but they were all his pallbearers when he died. But oh, still, wow. But still, you never heard of them, but it was his connections to those people. And um, mm -hmm. they people would say that he had this wonderful sense of humor, that he uh, dressed really well, that he, he was uh, uh, always making jokes. Um, you know, so I mean, he was a, a delightful character, but um, for some reason, he um, totally shied away from, I mean, I can't tell you how many mentions and stories about him are in the newspapers, but not one quote from him. Oh, for, so he kind of just kept going and going and going, but in different areas. What was his attraction to making money? Was it stability, family stability, or was it just that he really had this brain of, oh, I could do this? It seems like he doesn't understand the world word no and had the confidence and self-belief to be able to fulfill 
Like just go, oh, I can do this and I'm going to go and do it now. Well, I think I think that came from his dad. I mean, you think about how intrepid you have to be, again, to be Jew, 22 years mm -hmm. old from France, coming to this country yeah. all by yourself and just establishing congregations and, and businesses in each of those places and constantly being, because he, he was arrested with selling to a slave, uh, selling alcohol to a slave, and he took it all the way to Tennessee Supreme Court, lost three wow. times with um, 12 men juries, um, and he was clearly innocent. He, um, uh, uh, he, he had the business in downtown Knoxville on Gay Street, and the um, police arrested him for selling alcohol to a slave, the slave had been sent with a note from the hotel saying, uh, please sell, you know, two pints of liquor to and let Johnny bring uh, bring the uh, uh, liquor up here to Mr. Solomon, um, you know, and here's the money for it. He had the, and the hotel said, yes, we sent our slave down there to, um, to pick up the, the, the whiskey, but he was arrested and lost. Um, and I believe it's because of the, the fact that he it was a slave getting the uh, alcohol, but also because he was a Jew. And a, a Jew oh. in Knoxville, Tennessee at that time was unheard of. Uh, there mm. were seven families, I think, of Jews in, in Knoxville at the time. Um, well, a lot of times everyone thinks kind of Tennessee and like any of the Smoky Mountains region, right? Appalachia mm -hmm. is, is more Scottish, Irish, English descent, right? Not as much yeah. Jewish descent. Not at all Jewish <laughs> descent. Yeah, and, uh, I was thinking that because that was kind of a surprise to me. And I think that, I think the the attitude of I can get anything done came from that. His older brother was the first um, Jew buried in Knoxville, but he um, he died in the Civil War. He was a Confederate. He uh, uh, signed up for uh, to be a soldier immediately after uh, Tennessee succeeded in Nashville, and. Um, and and I just think that that the attitude of let's go get it, you know, was mm -hmm. kind of I mean, the smuggling, like you know, we can do that, we can outthink these people. And I think that that he saw that happen, um, and realized that that if you put your head to it, um, his head to it anyway, he was just damn it, going to get it done. And mm -hmm. that seemed to happen. I mean, fighting the politics of Tennessee like he did um, takes a lot of you know what. <laughs> Mm -hmm. to be able to yeah. Wow. Wow. This is fascinating. So it's available online, everyone. You can go get the book online, uh, like Amazon, all those places, but also go to your website. So that's something mellow as moonlight.com is the website. And we all remember that story now, right? Uh, so go get it. It's, again, it's called Manny Schwab and the George Dickel Company, not Dickens. So I do want to put George, I want to put Charles Dickens in the story. I think he would love this. Uh, but are you glad you did this? I mean, this is like a huge endeavor. How does it feel to finish this book? Um, to finish it is wonderful. <laughs> okay, but, <laughs> but um, I had no idea that I would learn what I've learned, and uh, and and understanding the the uh, era as well as my family uh, has been a delight. And uh, you know, I. Uh, I don't I don't have it in me to start something like this again. But um I <laughs> But are you finding it. stuff now? Are you finding things now that it's published and going, darn it, I wish I put that in the book too. I wish yes. I'd known. Yes. <laughs> yes, it, it keeps happening. <laughs> oh, I had and, a feeling about that. It's never there's done. Almost, there's almost nothing about George Dickel himself though. And that um, really and I, and I guess that's because of the um, you know, he was a shoemaker for 30 years and then he was living next door to these people that had all his money. And they, you know, it's the very first, the second year that he had the business, he was arrested for rectifying liquor without a license. He had no idea what he was doing. And, um, you know, so anyway, but he was a, a, a beloved member of the family. And uh, we had several family members named after him and his wife, Augusta. Oh, wow. So, and he wasn't Jewish, though. No, he was German immigrant. German, okay, so there, that's something interesting to think of in modern time history, you know, going to World War II. Here it is a German and, and, and you know, Jewish from France. That's amazing, the history. And, and, uh, and the newspaper obituary uh, pointed out that Manny was almost single-handedly responsible for the war bonds that were raised during World War I in Middle Tennessee. And that's with uh, 
with he married Emma Banzer, um, Augusta Dickel's Banzer uh, sister, and they were all had family in Germany. So he sent tons of money to the family in Germany during World War One and raised the the war bonds, you know, to to fight Germany. So um, wow. Um, he did a lot of work with Fanny Battle too. I don't know if you know who that is, what that is. It was a, a charitable organization back then. And uh, so he, he he did do his part. Mm. It seems like he had his hand in everything. How old was he when he died? He was uh, 60, no, he was 72. That's young. And an another little interesting anecdote is as they were burying him, the cascade distillery burned to the ground. What? Yeah, while they were burying him. Um, it was just coincidental. Uh, there was wildfires, but, um, <clears throat> and throughout, I mean, newspapers throughout Canada, throughout America, uh, talked about the, the great Cascade whiskey and, and how ironic it was that, you know, it burned down when Manny was uh, being buried. That's um, weird. I'm yeah, sorry, but it's weird. That's a, weird. you know, talk about spirits, you know? <laughs> Yes, that's that is I. you can't look at that and not go. That's odd. It's still like when I think about, um, you know, Fourth of July weekend, Thomas Jefferson and, and Adams dying on the same yeah. day. Yeah. To me, that's odd. That to me will never go down without me just going something. Something was that, you know, it was Adams last words. Jefferson lives. Yeah, I know. It's, just, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's amazing that, you yeah. know, those things that happen in history and it just makes you go. There's more. To at play than we know at this point, I believe, yeah. you know, yeah. and I love that kind of mystical. And you know what? In the South, that's the thing. I I love Southern fiction because there's always this air of mysticism that goes around mm -hmm. it. Going on. And yeah. this is a biography. It's not fiction. It's nonfiction, but <laughs> you've got it in there, right? You have to have the nonfiction to make the fiction, and you mm -hmm. don't need. You don't need fiction on this story at all. With, with the characters that are in the book, uh, from his sister to Meyer, uh, uh, Salz Cotter, to, I mean, the, the, there's some fascinating characters and stories in it. I really think that there's enough here for a movie or about, you know, a historic I think so. uh, biography or something. Because, um, I mean, it's just so many interesting things and it's exciting, mm -hmm. uh, exciting things, not just a bunch of numbers and a guy that made it rich. Yeah, and and it goes beyond the Jack Daniels, you know. Um, I think that's also some of the the history, you know, to for people to understand some of the real history of you know where whiskey was coming from and how and why. But what a story! I mean, just the the bootlegging, not necessarily bootlegging, but yeah, they were smuggling. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. is, but with wagons, and they had to be loaded the ground, loaded yeah. the ground, so you could. Yeah, there's be, only four four inches of fake bottom. And um uh, and they got arrested for making the wagons after after a while, but um uh, that the Jack Daniels thing, uh, George Dickel sued Jack Daniels because Jack the man because he was coming into to uh, Manny's saloons and trying to get people to drink his whiskey, and um and which no was way. it was tiny compared to Cascade at the time, but um when I was at, in London. Um, before I started really earnestly writing the book, and there was a, a, the Uber driver that picked me up was from Slovakia, and he had, he had just come to America to uh, England, and he asked me um, where are you from. I said Tennessee, and he went Elvis and Jack Daniels, <laughs> and I go, God, that could have been George Dickel. You know? I know, and, I know, right? The family, my family, sold the business in 1937 after uh, Prohibition. And my grandmother at my grandmother's home in Nashville, and she said that they all talked about it and said it just wasn't socially prominent enough to keep to keep it. We ought to sell it. If they hadn't sold it, I mean, its reputation would give you Happy Van Winkle's discussion about it. I really believe it would have been Jack Daniels uh, yeah. taking his place. But Jack Daniels was unheard of at the time. Wow! But look, yeah. look at look at how how he's going into the saloons. And trying to get, you know, many saloons, the, the audacity to do that, right? You yes, know, so yes. now, it, it, but you kind of have to have respect for that, too. It's kind of like, oh, yeah. I'm going for it. <laughs> well, he was you a brave little guy. He was very little. He, I think he was 5'2 or 5'3. But, yeah, I mean, he, um, uh, and, and uh, 
Uncle Nearest. I don't know if you know about that story. I mean, that was the the, the black slave who um, was the distiller for Jack Daniels. His name is now on a whiskey that's uh, very prominent. Um, but anyway, I, I think the whole industry is fascinating. And Chuck Cowdery was absolutely right. Uh, these companies need to really delve into their histories. And um, I'm, I'm very proud of the uh, Cascade Hollow. Now that's the George Dickel company. They're embracing this is the history. You know, let, let's, awesome. let's explain what the history was. And it's not just George Dickel. It's Manny Suave and Meyer Salfire, all the different things that are in the book. Uh, it's an that's interesting. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Well, I, you know, it, you know, when you go through cities like Nashville, you see the skyscrapers, you know, oh. and you think about the story you're telling me now and you're going, wow, like this has completely changed, hasn't it? Like, and your family has witnessed that well, change seven, of Nashville. Seven generations on my grandmother's, my grandmother's side, but five generations on the other side. And yes, it's night and day. I mean, I would ride my bicycle up and down the, the busiest street in Nashville going to Montgomery Bell Academy where I went to high school. And um, if you did that today, I don't think you'd make it 20 feet. You know, the, the, yeah. the traffic is so horrible. It's just way different, way different. Well, now I drive through Nashville, I think of the story of when Willie Nelson was so drunk one night after, you know, playing in some saloon or something right downtown, and you know, Music Row area. And he was so drunk, he lay down in the middle of the road and never got run over. He just <laughs> passed out in the middle of the road. And I'm like, how did you do that? He's got some, you know, there's that mystical thing. It's Willie. You can't bump him. You can't hit him. It's well, Willie. Well, a story similar to that was um, my grandfather, Buist, was Manny's, one of Manny's children. He had seven. Um, wasn't that interested in working. And Manny bought him a uh, Broadway and West End are the major, major artery right through Nashville. And it splits to 21st Avenue. And it, Manny bought the corner building there for him. It was a tire store. My grandmother said that um, he went in there to sell tires. His dad told him he had to go in there. And um, uh, nobody was coming in to buy tires. So he started drinking. And about one o'clock in the afternoon, he was drunk. And he went out in the middle, middle of the road, the busiest road there, selling people. Get in here and buy some damn tires. The police came and brought him to Manny and said, you know, your son is making an idiot of himself. You know, he's directing so, traffic. You could not stand out in that that road today, I promise you. Exactly. Oh. Like Billy Nelson couldn't do what he did. No, no. And I don't think he drinks now, but he does something else. <laughs> he's got a whole other empire going on. Yes, he does. And he, <laughs> makes, no, he, he makes no qualms about it. No, he's, he's happy. He's happy. <laughs> That's for sure. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Clay. It's been a true pleasure and congratulations on the book release. And um, I can't wait to see more about Manny around Nashville and, and through Tennessee, because it's not just Nashville, it's Tennessee history. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. And, and keep doing the work you all are doing, because it's really important. Thank you. Appreciate that. Everyone, again, the website is Mellow as moonlight.com you can get it from your you know get the book manny schwab and the george dickel company um by clay schwab uh, you can get that you know in your favorite bookstore try to get it in your local bookstore um online of course but if you go to the website he will send you a signed copy when you purchase it there so thank you so much again everyone take care and cheers <laughs> cheers thank you bye-bye Thanks for joining us here on Big Blend Radio's Eat, Drink, and Be Merry show. Keep up with our podcasts at BigBlendRadio.com and our magazines at BigBlendMagazines.com.